other isotopes and the rise of money. And related to these, among his other authorial works, he is co-authoring with Associate Professor Ken Sheedy, some of whom some of you would have heard last week at our annual report. So he's co-editing with um, <coughs> Ken Sheedy a multi-volume corpus, dice study, and metallurgical study of the archaic coins of Athens. And it is to this topic that he will speak to us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so without any further ado, I invite him to the lectern to deliver his paper, The Archaic Athenian Coin Project, Historical Implications. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stavros, um, for that kind of introduction. And um, thanks to the Australian Archaeological Institute for inviting me to come and speak. And thank you all, most of all, for coming, despite the serious level of competition from <laughs> not one but three other events I'm led to, led to understand. So this is not so much a, a paper as a, um, a ramble through um, archaic Athenian history. No, seriously, I'll try and keep it, it focused. Um, so this project. Well, it's had a long gestation period. We could have had several generations of elephant by now. Um, it's an Australian Research Council funded project on archaic Athenian coinage uh, in the period basically of the second half of the, the 6th century down to the Persian Wars. And it deals with the coinage of ancient Athens, which was first studied in detail, or the last major study, I suppose I should say, there were people beforehand uh, to study it was Charles Saltman, um, that uh, splendid gentleman on the right hand side of your screen. Um, who I believe is the only numismatist to have graced the front cover of Life magazine. Um, and he was indeed a larger than life figure. Um, he was famous not so much for his coinage. Um, he did do a great dye study of Olympia and he did this book, but more so for his um, training activities. Um, he was notorious, in fact, for selling the British Museum, its most expensive acquisition at that time, uh, from um, Crit, uh, from the Minoan. Uh, statue which had been created at least a month previously. <laughs> uh, so the participants in this study are Ken Shigi, looking very much like he did a week or so ago in full flight um, on the left hand side, uh, myself in the middle and Professor Damien Gore who is a professor of earth sciences of chemistry um, who has brought me up to claim monkey status on dealing with various analytical techniques which you shall see. So what we're doing, the slide's a bit dense, but it's really important to sort of locate what this topic is about. So we're exploring the thesis that locally mined silver had an important impact on the public revenues of the Athenian state. And so to do this, we're putting together a major die study and corpus of the archaic Athenian coinage. And what's unusual about it, apart from getting to actually do the study, um, is that it's included a really large statistical, statistically significant survey of the metal composition of the coins. And to do that, we have used a new technique of EDXRF, um, X-ray uh, fluorescence, um, which is uh, non-destructive. Now, I'm not going to go into that tonight, but basically it enables us to determine, give a reasonable approximation of the chemical composition of those coins. And fundamental to it, has been going through the, and I say over 40,000 coin catalogues, Pat Felch is here, and I've been tr I tried to pin her down, but she didn't know. Um, but I can't thank her and Basil Dimitriadi enough. This study would not have been possible without the, uh, the opportunity to spend literally months in this amazing private library. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, likewise to the, uh, um, to the uh, Athens Numismatic Museum and to, uh, to all the various other uh, museums where we do a lot of our research. So why Athens? Well, at the risk of sounding Athenocentric, um, Athens, we know more about Athens, uh, we have more literary sources uh, than anywhere else. And in fact, the coinage um, is in intimately linked with the other major uh, coinages, particularly in the archaic period. So getting a good handle on this, uh, we hope will enable a uh, better understanding of many of the other coinages, um, but also because understanding the, the coinage and the impact of monetization of the economy is what allows us to understand quite a lot about the changes in Athenian history, the development of the Athenian archaic empire uh, and the politics of the, of the time. 
So what I'm going to be discussing this evening are uh, the coin series, ore sources, metal analysis, weight, silver content and types. And then I'll try and put that all together uh, in terms of the coin sequence and dates, some quantification and some historical implications. I couldn't resist the comic on the, on the right now because basically that's what it seemed like over the many years that we've been doing this, this project. So, the boring bit. I know coins are not everybody's favourite topic, and they are for some of us, but basically you need a little bit of background. So really we have three series. On the top register, um, you have the uh, pretty little electron coins, the ones that have got quite a bit of gold, silver and a bit of copper in them. In the middle register, the so-called Wappenbunsen. They, they are known by this name, this name has stuck, it literally means heraldic coinage, uh, because of a theory that they were minted by aristocrats um, who had their own family crests, if you like, um, and that these were put onto the coins. And this is a theory that was developed because you can also find many of these types on vase painting um, and particularly on the shields of the people who are depicted on the, on the vases. And then down the bottom you have the famous owls. This is a particularly nice specimen. This is one of the very earliest of the, the owls, though they weren't so pretty later. So, trying to work out what order they came in. Well, we're going to deal with literary evidence a little bit later, but to start with, we need to understand that the earlier discussions of this topic actually put the owls before the Wappenbunzer. Um, and that was incorrect, um, as was um, demonstrated um, about 100 years ago. But the way of telling what order they came in took a little while longer than that. Um, so, Cray, around about 1960, was the one that pointed out that the coin started off with these um, pretty little um, uh, reverses. So if we just go back a stage, these are the obverses, the face of the, the coin. The reverses, the opposite side of them, um, uh, had no proper type on them. They simply had this cross or he. Um, these developed with this uh, little figure who's peeking out in that top uh, section there. Um, probably a panther um, or maybe a feline mask of some description and then they got the bright idea of going the whole hog and putting the whole face of the animal on there you can see where the pointer is and this continued uh, with the full type being on the reverse as well with the with the owls so that was the, the sequence of them another clue uh, the flans are uh, the designs the denominations so basically you can see a progression here from the left hand side where you have the, the type on, on both sides of the coin developing through into the owls and then they stopped worrying about pre-preparing the flans so nicely and started stri striking them because silver is pretty soft onto these uh, dumpy uh, fabric here and then they were debased as they had to produce massive amounts of coinage in the run up to the, to the Persian Wars and then when the uh, issuing of coins started again after a brief break at the end of the uh, Persian Wars a few years later, then they were on a different style and they had on them this wreath, which is generally linked to the victory in the uh, Persian Wars, but not necessarily, we have nothing to independently prove that, but, it, but the series is quite different from instance from these ones where the helmet doesn't have the wreath, so it makes them fairly, fairly easy to pick. Um, Electrum. Initially people thought, starting with donkeys, um, and we're talking sort of uh, 150 years ago now, that coinage developed out of Asia Minor and that the coinage, uh, that basically what was happening in the main Greek world was that uh, it was following the development of Electrum coinage in Asia Minor and then they didn't really have adequate supplies of electrum or gold to mix with silver to make electrum and therefore they decided to, to mint in silver instead. Unfortunately that theory does not work, seductive though it seems, and in actual fact the later development of the types, I showed you the ones with the cross on the reverse, ended up being in this sort of quadripartite shape. Um, these are very small coins, the coins are absolutely minuscule, they, they weigh around about um, 0.6 of a, of a gram and so they didn't bother too much with the with the reverse they had these very simple reverses and they're not dilinked but they're of a similar type 
um, to the reverses found on the wheels, which I'm going to demonstrate to you came right at the end of the, the Barbin Monson series. So they need to be they need to be downdated um, a little bit later. There is a third type of electrum coin, which is the owl, um, and this proved to be difficult to understand for quite some time because it wasn't on the Attic standard, it was on the Focaic standard. Um, the reverse is different, you can see it, it's got what appears to be a ligature, which was um, um, considered, oh, Nikki, which was considered to be um, an alpha tau ligature, which theoretically might have stood for Athens, even though the theta was used and not a, not a tau at Athens. But the problem with the weight standard, various other problems in terms of when the coins were found, they were all found together around about the 19th century. Astonishingly, almost all of them had provenances, like found in the Ilyssus River, um, helpful things like that. Um, it's extremely unlikely that they uh, were genuine um, archaic coins. Yeah. Which is a shame for anyone that owes one of them because they're extremely valuable, so maybe I shouldn't advertises too widely. So how can we date the adoption of coinage? Well, there's quite a lot of literary evidence and there's quite a lot of suspects from whom to choose. Um, if you believe Pollux, Polydeucas, um, then the introduction of coinage belonged to the mythological uh, kings, the half snake, half man, Erichthonius or Leucos. Plutarch puts forward Theseus uh, and the bull. Um, we've seen some bull coins, so um, you can understand where that is, that is coming from. Uh, the discovery of the Athenian Politeia um, put forward some interesting theories. Uh, Dracon, you have the death penalty, as you didn't get the illusion, uh, in book four, um, suggested that Dracon was the one who uh, introduced coinage. But the favourite ever since the discovery of the Apollo has been Solon, um, because there are a number of different people who suggested that he was responsible for it. We have Plutarch, who didn't seem to have a problem saying that it was Theseus in another book, um, wrote extensively on the use by Solon of coinage for very specific measures. Um, the Athapol um, claimed it was Solon. And then we have a couple of the Atidographers. So we have fragments of Androphium and Philochorus um, attributing this to Solon. So it's not too surprising that earlier historians had um, no problem in trying to attribute the coinage to Solon. Sadly, they were wrong. <laughs> and we have to ask why. And the most likely explanation is that by the fourth century, coinage had been in use for 150 years, let's say. And the only reason that I can really come up with is that at that stage, they had no conception of an economy that wasn't monetized. And given the tendency to attribute everything to an earlier founder, um, they naturally attributed it to, to Solon. Um, if that's the case, and I think I can prove that, uh, that it is, then we have to also wonder about many of the other things that are attributed to Solon. So this is not to knock Solon off his pedestal. It's not to say that he wasn't responsible for making changes to the Politeia, because I think almost certainly he was. Um, but many of the other measures that are attributed to him on the basis of fourth century evidence have to be looked at somewhat more critically. Now, one of the major ways that we can go about determining when um, the coins were actually introduced is from hoard evidence. So I need to note that no Wappen, Munzen or Owls are found in hoards before 510. Now, the dating of these um, hoards is a little bit suspect. There are several of them that are very important. One is the Taranto hoard. Uh, which uh, Bishop Osset has dated to 510, but that's um, uh, certainly too early. Uh, and the current understanding is 500 or later, more likely to be around about 490. And this is based on comparing the styles of the various um, uh, coins and where they're introduced. It's a, a lovely board uh, because there are so many coins from different polis in it. Um, but we also have um, the Eleusis hoard, the Eleusis find, um, which is dated conventionally somewhere between 520 and 500, but that uh, is also being studied by Ken Chidi, my partner in this at the moment. Um, and it's got um, six fractions, um, three wheel obbles, um, a gorgon obble, a bull's head, um, and one 
um, our Hemi drachma, uh, which tells us something about, so even if it's around about 500, then this gives us a bit of a terminus antiquem. Uh, we have the Acropolis Horde that's a little bit later, that's from the destruction, obviously, of the, the Persians, um, that has 54 coins in it, um, and they comprise owls and wheel fractions, and the finds in the Agora. There are issues with using hordes for, for dating. Um, you have to test your own assumptions here. What was the horde? How was the horde comprised? Uh, a single horde, n equals one. It's not terribly convincing on a statistical basis. Um, so it can be atypical and misleading. We don't know the circumstances of the recovery. Often these hordes are put together later. The, hoard, the coins come flooding into the market. We've got a case of that right now. Um, but working out where the coins are actually coming from, um, who found them, how they were dispersed, um, can be difficult. And unfortunately, there are very few fixed dates. If only they would put the date on the coin. I mean, they're so much more useful nowadays, but in those days they didn't. Um, and so one of the fixed dates that has been used by practically everybody is the so-called uh, Persepolis fortification tablet, um, which dates accurately to 499 BC. But sadly, we wrote to um, Professor Mara Coolroot, who kindly provided us with some better photos, and in fact the impression is not from a coin. Um, so it is an owl, but it's not, not from an actual um, coin. So there goes one of our secure datings that was just so wonderful to have that date, and unfortunately it's not there. And of course you've got to remember that the dating is only a term of the quem. Uh, it can be any time uh, previously. So where did the silver come from? Well, we read in Herodotus and Aristotle uh, that need for cremata uh, took place just to Thrace, where silver was mined. And so the current understanding, what you'll find in every book that's written on the subject and every article, is with the exception of Professor Lavelle, is that the silver for the Barton Winston was mined in Thrace, um, and it was the loss of Thrace uh, to the Persians in 512, which was the catalyst to more intensive exploitation of the Labrian uh, silver mines. It's always been a little bit odd, um, considering that Herodotus at Book 7 um, states quite clearly that the Thracian tribes had control of the, of the interior. And you'd have to wonder in practical terms, how did somebody just turn up on the Thracian coast and in 10 years manage to mine uh, all the silver that would, they would need. I've investigated this in a lot of detail, what is required to actually mine, and let me put it simply, there are hundreds, thousands of tonnes of rock required to be excavated in the right place in order to find silver, if you're looking in the right place, I mean. Um, so it's extremely unlikely on first principles that Pisces could just go there, have the free run of the place, have the security to do what he needed to do, unhindered by the local Thracians and just start digging. Okay, so that was never, as far as I was concerned, a terribly likely hypothesis. But we can bring science to bear on the, on the subject, which I'll do at the moment. So more of the common understanding. We currently understand that silver came in the west from Spain, a little bit from Etruria, from Thrace, Lavrion and Sifnos, so we understand from Herodotus that the Sifnian mines were being depleted, and from Asia Minor. And that these zones were pretty well divided up so that the Carthaginians controlled the production of silver in the west, that the Greeks controlled in the middle, and that the Persians obviously had their own silver and were likely to keep it. And in fact, that when silver was hoarded, where it tends to crop up was in Persia, and in Egypt, and that the main sources that one needed to worry about were Spain, Thrace, and Labrion, and a little bit earlier, Sifnos. Uh, the theory is that the Egonetan coins were minted as a sort of trade currency, that they were minted from the silver from Sifnos. So how does all that stack up? You will be surprised to know, no plot spoiler, that this doesn't work out terribly well. I teamed up with Professor Stosgale from Oxford, who runs the Oxalid data base, which has some 6,000 uh, samples of mines, ores, and coins, um, to have a look again at the analyses that were done by her and her late husband some years ago in the Metallurgy and Numismatic volume that was written. 
um, well, quite some years ago now, some 20 years ago, which was based in terms of where it was looking for silver sources on um, the hypothesis that I've just put to you a moment ago. And in fact, to be fair to them, they said some of these um, analyses are not terribly conclusive about where it's come from, but given these are the only sources, this is where we're going to have to attribute things. Well, having widened the, the uh, parameters, if you like, uh, to see where else we could go, we come up with some very, very interesting things. You can see down here that Lavrion is accounting for about a third of the, of the silver. And you can see that the Kalkitiki, um, Pangaeon, account for another 23%. And if you add in Thesos, which is very difficult to distinguish, you're up to about 27%. So we've got roughly another third coming from there. However, there are some surprises. There is silver there from Spain. There is silver from Iran, which shouldn't be there um, if it's only going into, um, into Persia and, and not leaving the place. But more to the point, there's a massive amount from the Rhodope Mountains, now they're in the sort of north of Greece, mostly in Bulgaria, um, from Romania, um, and from the, from the Taurus Mountains. So what's, what's going on? The thing to note here is that Sifnos accounts for so little of the, of the silver output. If we take this a little bit further, and we have a look at the Athenian coins per se, um, I've put up here a couple of the, um, of the plots that I've got, uh, but I'll take you through this first before we discuss it further. Seven Batamunzen were analysed, and we find that only two of them come from northern Greece. Three, in fact, come from Spain, uh, which would have, under the current hypothesis, would have been impossible. One from Iran, even more impossible, and over, only one from Lavrion, and in fact that's the wheel, which sort of supports my independently derived conclusion that the wheels were actually later. I'll go into this in more detail, but I believe that the wheels were actually being minted at the same time as the, as the Athenian owls. When we look at the analysis for the early owl tetradrachms, we find that 18 of them came from Lavrion, one of them came from Kapiliki or Thassos, and one of them came from Romania. So how can we interpret these data? Well, basically, I think it's clear that the Babenwunzen were not coming particularly from Spain. Now, admittedly, this is a relatively small sample. However, um, if we exclude the wheel, um, basically, we have four out of the six coins that are not coming from northern Greece. It seems unlikely um, that, Greece, that, um, that northern Greece was the, the number one point. It seems unlikely that the Pisistogens were actually getting the majority of their silver from there. What seems more likely is that they were opportunistically getting silver from wherever. And what I haven't put up here, and I don't have time to do so, is that I did the same analysis with the coinage from Egana, um, the, the coinage from Chios, um, from many other polis that are represented in these data. And in fact, you can see, for instance, instance that Egana, which is theoretically getting its silver from Sifnos, in fact is getting its silver from Lavrion, mostly, which has a couple of important implications, not the least of which being the dating of the Egonetan material. Um, a little while ago, um, uh, Helene uh, Nicolet Pierre actually suggested that the Egonetan coinage was too early um, and that it needed to be downdated. I have to say, this is one of the few areas where I have a strong disagreement with Ken, um, who would like to keep it back earlier. But these um, uh, lead isotopic data would seem to confirm that that coinage is actually somewhat, somewhat later. But the Pisistogen theory needs to go out the window. That's pretty obvious. So moving along to a slightly uh, different topic. I'm going for time. Okay. Um, adherence to weight standard. Um, this is one of the keys for looking at whether a coinage is designed for export or not. And if I can just um, explain this a little bit. You're familiar with currencies like the euro or the American dollar being international trade currencies. So those currencies need to be strongly supported. Everybody needs to be prepared to accept them. That's how it works nowadays. In the days when the coinage was based on its actual metal content, 
Um, then if the coinage was actually at its bullion value, then people would accept it for bullion. In this case of the Athenian coinage, the uh, coin standard was about 5% less than the weight standard. So there's that small uh, difference, which is accounted for in the, the charge of the, the minting, and there are historical references to that as well. But a coinage that was used domestically inside its own polis didn't have to be at the actual weight standard because it was circulating because wherever the writ of that polis ran, the coinage would be accepted. And that's how our currency works today. I come from Australia. If I have Australian dollars and I look to use them in Australia, my paper dollars, which are valueless as bits of paper, can buy things because wherever the government's writ runs, it is operating as a fiduciary currency. So there's a big difference between the two of these. So here, where we're looking at these our tetradrachms, they're minted on the attic standard, which is 17.28 grams. And when we analyze them, we find that the average weight is 16.91 grams, which is only 2.2% under the actual weight standard. 27 of the coins actually weigh more than the weight standard. And this suggests that the coins were actually being produced by batch. They're being very tightly controlled, and that if you buy these as, a, as bullion, in effect, that you're getting basically around about the correct weight standard for the coins. And if you take into account some loss due to corrosion, uh, the circumstances of deposition of these coins, cleaning, these sorts of things, then 2% is a very small amount. And so we can be reasonably sure that the coins were actually being minted around about their ideal weight standard. We make a comparison to the ovals, which are not being minted for export. These are being minted for domestic consumption. We can see that the ideal weight is 0.72 grams, but the average weight is actually only 0.60 grams. So they're 18% less. Now, small coins do suffer more in handling. There's no doubt about it. The, a lot of these coins are far more worn. So there needs to be more allowance made for loss of weight for that reason. However, it's pretty clear that these ovals were being minted deliberately under standard, presumably to defray the cost of minting, and arguably to make a profit for the state. And if I can just bring in one further comparison there, the Buffenons and Dijakons were struck approximately 4.3% under standard, and most of them have suffered less wear um, than the, than the Tetradrachons. So obviously there was a fiduciary element there. I haven't got time to go through this, but the earlier the coins were, um, the more under standard they were. So quite clearly they were bringing their weight standard up to the correct weight. So the last of them in the sequence, the Gorgons are actually fairly close to their weight standard, whereas the early ones are much less. Going now to the question of silver content, um, here n equals 424 coins, these were ones that we analysed, and we were looking at what the percentage of silver is, so this is just a very basic analysis. And you can see that approximately three quarters of the coins were over 98% silver. 5% of them were less than 95% silver. In case you think this is something unusual, in actual fact, the coins that we analysed from most other polos were also at around about this same sort of figure. So whilst the Athenians did a really good job on marketing, that their silver is really good, uh, in fact, if you got a coin from, um, from Chios, let's say, um, it would have just, it would have been as good. So this probably points to the manufacturing technique, um, that their method of determining when the coin had been sufficiently refined, the coupleation process had gone through far enough, was when the coin metal, the molten metal, was super oxygenated and then it tends to spur. So this is an empirical thing. They don't need to know chemistry, they just need to know that it gets to this point. It's fairly wasteful. A lot of silver goes up the chimney, it gets lost into the couple, but basically the coin is around about this amount of, of this percentage of silver. If it's got other stuff in it, there could be two reasons. And the thing that you find most often in silver coinage is copper, um, which was deliberately added, but not necessarily as a fraud. Um, it was also to make the coins uh, stronger. So the northern coins are uh, the coins from uh, that come from the Thrace, Thracian region often have 
a fair amount of copper added to them, but sometimes you find quite a lot of iron or other things. There were uh, fraud um, in antiquity as well as in modern days. It's sometimes difficult to, to tell the, the difference between the two. Anyway, when I first saw these results, I was all, I was all thrilled because I knew from looking at our database that around about 5% of coins are test cut. You can see one down in the, in the bottom right hand corner. And this is to prove whether the metal is metal all the way through. And we now have a better handle on this because quite a lot of coins in antiquity from this archaic period were actually silver plated. It wasn't just the ones that were being issued at the end of the Peloponnesian War. Um, it was something that was actually done fairly routinely. And so it's no surprise that they wanted to test through to strike into the metal to see whether it was good metal all the way through. So I saw initially, hmm, 5% of the coins are less than 95% silver. Almost exactly 5% of the coins were uh, test cut out of our sample. Surely the two would line up. But when I looked at the coins that had been test cut, I found that most of them were actually made out of good silver. So my conclusion from that is that about 5% of the coins were routinely test cut um, to see, particularly where they were hoarded, where a lot of these coins have been found, which is in Egypt, for instance, as I said before, in, in Asia Minor. So there must have been routine testing going on, not testing based on suspicion uh, of a particular coin. Um, now, there are all sorts of penalties, uh, particularly in the 4th century for in Athens for putting out fraudulent coinage. Uh, you wouldn't want to get caught. Um, trying to tender coinage like that, um, but obviously their ability to actually judge it was very poor, judging by the coins that have been tested. Um, if they were really trying to test them based on ones that they thought were, were bad, they were doing a really bad job at it. So I think another explanation is required. Uh, incidentally, if you look at the, um, at the, the graph up here, um, you can see, if you, if you look at the x-axis here, where you're looking at the, uh, the weight, you can see where the, the coins actually cluster. Um, there isn't a relationship between the silver content, AG, chemical site for silver, on the left-hand side. Um, the coins that weigh less are the ones that have been chopped up in antiquity. Some of them you used for hacked silver, for instance, or they were, um, they were cut in some, some fashion, or they were really badly corroded. So you've got some coins there. But they were still made out of, out of uh, good silver, as you can see. Whereas some of the others that are actually at that weight, these are the, the problem ones, obviously, the ones that are falling in the less than 95% uh, silver category. And mostly they have iron in them though sometimes there's some really peculiar things in them as well. Moving along to the coin types, this whole notion of whether they were heraldic or not. Well, the semiotics of all of this is something that we haven't really got a good grip on, um, but it's something we need to get into. But if we drill down into them a little bit, if you look at the owls um, and the, uh, the knuckle bones, the uh, astrolabos and the um, amphorae, you can see that they were actually on um, pre-Persian War weights. Now, don't ask me why they thought knuckle bones would be a good indicator of um, weight. There were also dolphins and shields, like the Boeotian-style shield, um, but they didn't turn up on coins. My suspicion would be that they were being used elsewhere. Um, but clearly, these were state types. These were not things that were on individual shields or belonging to, to nobles. We have an, another lot of them, the horses, uh, which have generally been identified with the Pisistidae, um, who had a loving for all things horsey. Um, that wasn't unusual. All the, all the aristocratic geni liked their, um, liked their horses. Um, think about the category, the hippies, for instance. Um, so hippias, hipparchos, etc. So we have whole horses, we have backs of horses, we have fronts of horses. Um, we also have the Gorgons. Now, the Gorgons were the coin par excellence, and we'll come to them in a moment, and they are undoubtedly uh, associated with Athena. On the reverse of them, uh, when they started putting reverses on, you can see bulls and, and felines of some description, and presumably uh, these were symbols of strength, endurance, whatever else um, in semiotic terms you could think of in terms of, of bulls and Athena, etc. And then we have some that we're not so sure about. Um, I couldn't resist putting in that little picture from the Agora Museum of Atriscalus, 
um, the, the, the three legs running, but we also have a, a cart. Um, we have a beetle. We have lots of little beetles. If anyone can come up with any good working theories on the beetle, I'd be very pleased to hear them. And we have lots and lots and lots and lots of wheels. Um, and the wheels, well, we can make some guesses at the wheels. The wheels are the most populous type. Um, Ken's theory is that they might have been looking at the post-democratic, like in the stage after the democracy had been brought in, something that was not aristocratic, um, but these wheel types had been existing beforehand. Um, there's a remark in um, Herodotus, um, 7.140, where he reports a Delphic oracle uh, talking about Athens being the wheel-shaped city, uh, which is a bit of a pun, I guess, uh, because Trocos um, is a wheel, but it's also battlements. Um, and I suppose that could reflect the, the shape of the city. But for whatever reason, uh, they, were the, they were the type par excellence. So finally, we can move to the, to the coin sequences, and you'll have to bear with me a little bit because this is a, a, a tad confusing. But what is clear out of this is that the, the earlier button ones and types were being minted in only two denominations, in the diagram and in the obel. In case you think that's strange, if you actually handle, for instance, a drachm, a drachma and a didrachma, it's awfully difficult to the uninitiated to tell the difference between the two. Even though one is double the size of the, or double the weight of the other, um, they're not so easy to tell apart if the types are the same. Um, so a theory that was developed by Tracy Riddle was actually that it was easier to differentiate them in some way. If they were going to be the same type, then they needed to be some way apart in terms of their, in terms of their weight. Otherwise, it would be easier to actually have different types so that you could distinguish between the two. Um, the ones in green, uh, the fore part of the horse and the rear part of the horse, we have been able to dial link. I have to say we haven't got as far with the dial linking as we like to, but it rather appeals to me that the front and the back of the horse actually come together. Um, and then there's the triskelis and the amphora are also dial linked uh, together. So we would consider that to be stage one, and it would be from 535 BC. It's very, very, very difficult to sustain the existing belief that these coins should date from the beginning of Pisistratus's uh, reign, rule, as Tara, if you like, in 545 BC. Um, they have to be downdated, and I'd have to say that 535 is about the absolute earliest that we could put these, put these coins. The next series is the Gorgon, and they have to stand by themselves because the Gorgon marks the transition from the didrachm to the tetradrachm. It marks the transition to putting the reverse type on the, on the coins. These numbers, by the way, are the numbers of examples that we actually have. And given that we've gone through in such detail collecting them, obviously there will be more. I'm not going to say that we have every example, but we must be moving fairly rapidly, given the law of diminishing returns to having most of these coins, the ones that I've been working in at Flybury for the last uh, couple of weeks, and um, the, mostly I'm finding coins that I've already found beforehand and being able to link them up in terms of sales, um, but we've gotten to the point where there are very, very few new coins that are, uh, examples of coins that are actually being found, and certainly no more types which is very encouraging because that means that statistically speaking, we've got enough of these coins to be fairly confident that we've got the whole lot. So if you have 41 examples of something, then it's unlikely in statistical terms that you're going to be, able, you're going to be finding more different uh, types. You'd expect to find these one. It's not impossible. And for the earlier series, where they're relatively low numbers, um, if you've got three cartwheels or two full horses or whatever, that's not a lot of them. You could just as easily not have any of them and not know that that type existed. So you can have less statistical confidence in those. But for these later ones, we have lots of them, so we can be reasonably sure. Um, and they have quite a few bubbles to, to go with them. The number is a bit hard to tell. Um, I'm doing the, the wheels, Ken is doing the gorgons, hopefully he will do them soon. Um, it's going to be lots of fun because they're very worn out. Um, the dies were obviously struck to exhaustion, so they're not so, not so easy to, uh, to tell. We have the electrum wheels, which I mentioned earlier, you can see down the bottom there. Uh, these are actually obbles and diobbles, and they're valued at drachmas and didrachmas very happily. And then we have the wheels. 
of which there are extremely large numbers, particularly in the, in the ovals. So my working hypothesis is, and given the hoard evidence that I gave before, that pretty well only the wheels are found in the later hoards, um, that the, in actual fact, the fractional coinage, the smaller coinage, was actually being filled domestically by these wheels, and that the larger coins were being filled by the tetradragons, which you can see down here, which are in huge numbers. We also have some hemiovals, and sorry, they're the subject of the next book, um, but just to quantify this a little bit, we have around about 1,000 Barbenwinsen, and we have about 3,000 tetradragons. So they have been minted in enormous, our tetradragons, they have been minted in enormous numbers by the time you're getting into the, into the fifth century. But what they lack is many small coins. So I don't think it's possible that they were only minting large coins and not small coins. If previously they had lots of fractions. It's hard to imagine people being able to operate in the Agora now without any fractional coinage. So basically, a more likely theory, or the one that I'm running with, is that the, the fractional coinage was being filled by these wheel ovals and to a lesser extent, the Gorgon ovals. And very quickly, just to quantify it a little bit, if we go back to that first stage and look at 25,000 die drachms, we don't know how many coins you could produce out of one die. Um, but if we say 25,000, which is about the upper limit that anyone would go with, estimates range from about 10 to 25,000, but even if we go to the upper limit, we multiply it out, um, then we're coming to 8.33 talents. That figure could well be half of that. Well, given all we know about the expenses of the Pisces today, um, building temples, uh, employing mercenaries, uh, doing public uh, works, etc., etc., they wouldn't have gotten very far um, with eight talents. Okay, so something has to give. Should we assume one die per annum? Well, this has the, been the working basis for all of these assumptions about Greek coinage hitherto. But I would challenge that very strongly. There's absolutely no reason why we should be assuming that one die should be associated with one year. Um, in fact, looking at the sources of the silver, as we did earlier, it seems clear that they were minting opportunistically in terms of their access to silver rather than on a calendar basis. In fact, the whole notion of an annual um, striking of a die comes from Roman numismatics when they actually have money as. There's nothing ever that would lead us to believe that there were Greek money as filling the same function. That is just an idea that has been imported from from elsewhere. And that's why we had the ones and the idea of the heraldic coins that the individual noble was striking their coin for that year. But all of that needs to, to go out the window. So I would say that it's much more likely that in actual fact the scale of minting started off very slowly and then increased. And that you were seeing more dies and types and subdivisions, etc., as you went along. Which brings me, happily, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know, to the conclusions that first of all, coinage at Athens should be down dated to around about 535 or later. That minting increased literally exponentially, started off very slowly, and you can see these numbers going up in an exponential pattern. That the Bapin ones and types, and of course the owls, were state controlled right from the very beginning. So this has to make us think about the nature of the Athenian state. Um, if we've no longer got independent nobles running around, all of these sort of historical ideas that have been associated with that, we've actually got the state in control of what is going on, um, then we have a very different uh, sort of Athenian administration. Trying to pin down the role of the state is one of these very uh, nebulous sorts of, sorts of things. Everyone talks about the state, but they can't really define what they mean by that. The owls commenced on this basis around about 515, but it is perfectly possible that it was later than that. It can't be a lot later um, because of the fines of those hordes, and we can only try and narrow that down as we go, but the range would be 515 to 510. They were intended for export, they were tightly controlled, the weight I'll demonstrate to the silver percentage, and above all, the advertising. They probably stopped minting the gorgons because many other polys minted gorgons. You can have organs in Neapolis, etc., all over the place. When they wanted something that was really Athenian, that everybody would know was Athenian, we have Athena, we have the owl, and we have the ethnic 
on it. It makes it abundantly clear that these corners come from, uh, come from Athens. The Vapinoids and fractions certainly overlap the owls. Now we know that because from the Persian destruction, you have the larger coins are the tetradrachms, the smaller coins are the fractional owls. So they must have been acting together. Electron coinage was minted opportunistically somewhere around about this time on the same basis. Test carbon, as I mentioned, was done routinely to 5% of the coins. Turning to literary evidence, the literary sources sadly are very unreliable or they've been willfully misinterpreted. So for instance, when Herodotus and, and the Athpole tell us that Pisicetus went to Thrace for Kremata, Kremata just means literally valuable things. It does not necessarily mean coins. They could have been letting themselves out as mercenaries. They could have been getting allies. They could have been getting um, contributions to their fighting fund in a whole number of different ways. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were taking up the occupation of being miners. Silver sources ranged from Spain to Iran, and it was not unidirectional. In fact, silver could go from Spain to the east, um, or as far as the Persian Empire, could just as easily go from the Persian Empire west. And as I said, Pisicetus didn't mine in Thrace. So that's basically it. Um, some time for some questions, if you would, if you would like. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, many thanks, Jay. Many sure. thanks for that. So, questions? Yes, uh, Professor. Considering the timing or the dating of the coins, I have heard uh, some comments about the grand uh, inscription in Gortis in Crete, mm -hmm. which predates, I think, 7th or 9th century. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, some comment that uh, between the text there, yeah, you can make, you can really deduct that he was talking about the wealth and uh, some going with uh, man, with Crema Crema. Yes. Now, if that is, it means yes. that there were something about the 7th or 9th century BC, or the minimum times or post minimum times in Crete. Absolutely. There's no doubt at all that um, silver and gold and many other things have had value. Um, you can read Homer and uh, you can hear um, how wealth is described, um, and it includes uh, silver and gold. If you go to Solon's poems, it includes uh, descriptions of um, gold and silver as being valuable items. And I think there's no doubt at all that silver was being used in trade. Um, it has lots of advantages. Um, it doesn't go off. If you have your wealth in barley, um, it's going to depend on the season, how much barley is around, what condition you can keep it in, what quality the grain is, and so forth. But the laws in Athens were actually denominated in barley. The Pentacosio Medimnoi, the 500 bushel men, for instance. So that's how, that's how that actually works out. Um, but in the east, where they've been using precious metals for um, thousands of years, in actual fact, they had a much more sophisticated system. So they actually uh, worked on what we would consider to be a commodities exchange. They actually had values, and, the, and we have the Babylonian records that, that give you on a month-by-month -month basis, and uh, Vargas has published these, um, actually in exchange for all commodities that changed every single month of the of the year so they could say um, that the wheat was worth x amount of silver today and it was only worth um, less uh, the next day um, so that was a much more sophisticated arrangement and in fact one of the arguments why the east probably didn't take up the adoption of coinage was they probably saw it as being less sophisticated but silver uh, the, um, the purchase of the cave of machpella for instance is for sil is by silver shekels weights in this case, but it actually, the, the, um, the bit in the Bible actually says, at that day's value, people know about the purchase for the, for the silver, but they forget that actually gives you a way of working out how it was valued. So I totally agree with you. Uh, from Gordon and elsewhere, um, they would have been using uh, silver, um, but they wouldn't have been using it as coined silver. That um, invention um, was yet to happen. Yes, um, it depends on the method that you're using, um, hence our rather large grant from the European Research Council to hopefully elucidate this somewhat further. Um, if you're talking lead isotopic analysis, 
Um, it's actually dating the age of the deposit. It's not dating the, the coin itself. So it's dating the, the lead. Um, it's preferred in terms of dating because isotopes do not change through the process of manufacture. Whereas the chemical composition of the coin does change um, as it gets heated up, melted, um, some things go up the chimney like arsenic and so forth. Um, anything that is less than the boiling point of silver um, or whatever they need it, 940 odd degrees, and they probably take it up to 1000 degrees, so anything that's less than that is going to, is going to go up. As I said, it's very wasteful. So, I mean, what I mean is, when they wanted to make this, they wanted to be 96 percent silver. Yes. How did they, did they sort of think about it, have so much silver and add to that so much copper and so much iron? No, no, it's the other way around. They have their, they, sorry, they have their, um, their ore, um, which has been sort of, uh, is a mixture of uh, lead, which is required, is a sort of medium that is required to actually enable you to extract the, uh, the silver. And in this part of the world, it was simple because the ore actually came from Galena, which is actually a, uh, a, a mixture of lead and silver. So basically that came naturally. Um, and so they would heat this up in a couple, which is sort of like a, a bone ash material that will allow the impurities to go into it. So some of them go up the chimney, some of them go into the couple. And what is left is this mixture of the noble metals, any gold that was there, um, the silver and the lead. And then they could just take off, because it separates into layers, um, they could take off the lead and they would be left with the silver gold mix. So knowing when they got into that point is part of this empirical process of what they were, what they were actually doing. But in terms of analysing that, um, it's gone through this whole process um, by which it's not, um, it's not the same that it started. So it's very difficult to use chemical analysis to determine origin. What chemical analysis can be used for is to determine similarities. So is this from that same batch? It will have the same fingerprint, if you like. It will have the same mixture of impurities in it. But what it cannot do, and what people claim it can do sometimes, but they are absolutely dead wrong, is chemical analysis cannot tell you the source of the, of the coin. Now, I am using uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, to try and put these, uh, because we have so much data now, to be able to put these coins into groups so we can try and say which ones belong together, which came from the same batches, but that's not the same as saying where it came from. If you want to find out where it comes from, then you need to use isotopes. So hitherto, the isotopes that have been used have been lead primarily because it's very easy to work with. There are three isotopes that you can use, so it's very handy, uh, or four actually. Um, Copper isotopes, which have been used only to a lesser extent, which is a shame because there is copper in, in these coins. But the one that we're going to be using as part of this grant that has never been used before um, in this context to look at coinage is actually silver isotopes, which is the metal from which the coins have been made. And that's important because the ores from Spain, for instance, do not natively contain lead, so the lead had to be added. So if you were doing lead isotopic analysis on a coin that had come from Spain, you're actually measuring where the lead came from, not necessarily where the silver came from. Could I ask a question following up on that? And it's a question born out of total ignorance. Um, you, you showed very nicely how um, the acquisition of silver could be very opportunistic. Mm. So using what they could find at any given point in time. Yes. Um, and so you, know, you might say they melted down a silver vessel that came from the humans mm. and, uh, and then they had some s silver from Spain or yes. elsewhere. Yes. What happens if they, when they melt down yes. silver from more than one source Absolutely. and then make coins out of that amalgam. Yes. Uh, it's an can the isotope yes. analyses help yes. in such a situation and um, how? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, it's one of the reasons why we were doing so much work into determining what was the nature of this um, silver. Quite clearly later on, if you go post Alexander, then the, much of the silver is inextricably mixed. By the time it's got to the Persians, it's been liberated and it's travelled back west. Um, then it's going to be mixed down. Um, when you're talking about these small batches of meeting, then what we seem to be looking at, because um, there have been lots and lots of testing that I've done with Professor Soskal, when you look at that, you can see that 
they seem to be, and their chemical composition bears this out, they have the same fingerprint for these for these coins, so we can see it. But to answer your question directly, um, it is linear. Um, if you have a mixture of two things, then the proportions in which they were mixed will determine how far along that straight line they actually occur. Um, if you have three or more, too bad. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> well, the first is totally what you've been just discussing about. So I just want to make clear that I have a list of correct. You, you, you say that from the massive isotopic analysis, you are certain on uh, the provenance of the coinage, of the metal, sorry. Yes. You can, you can actually be sure whether the metal, from the analysis, that the metal comes from Spain or from Latin or from Iran. Yes. Okay. Yes. I understand yes. that well. Okay. Yes. Thanks for that. Now, I have a different question. Okay. Just before you get there, yeah. can I just add one thing in? What we're not so sure about, just for the yeah. interest of transparency, is where the fields overlap one another. And this is true of much of Thrace. So it's very difficult to say whether the, whether the coins come from uh, Pangaean or from, uh, from Alexander the first mines or, or whatever. And the reason for this is there simply have not been enough analyses of the, of the mines themselves in that region to be totally clear. So there are not enough samples to be 100% sure about that. So we know that it comes from that region and we can distinguish that quite clearly uh, from uh, another uh, region. have a look here, um, you can see the fields are quite discreet. If you look down in Labrion, for instance, you can see where the Labrion ores come from and you can see where those coins are. If you move up here to the Rodopi, you can see the area that's in, etc. So you have greater or lesser confidence depending on where you are within that, within that circle. Okay, so this is just a rough plot of it. Um, it's sort of clearer to see on this, on this lower one here. But you're not going to muddle up um, the ores that come from the Rodopi um, with the ores that come from Labrador, for instance. That's the reason. Do you have come to this uh, conclusion through, uh, through examining the, the ores from the... Ores and slags, yes. From the mines. From, from the mines, from the mines yes. yes, that's right. From the mines. Yes, and comparing them with the coins, yes. I have a totally Please. Good question yes. concerning the black and and the main types. Yes. Well, this is a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Yes. Because, I mean, okay, all this theory about the aristocracy, well, it's a bit peculiar, of course. But from the other side, when you say this is a state coinage, yes. do we have any other examples of our kind of coinages, state coinages, that use multiple types? Um, because it's very, uh, it's yes. very strange. I mean, you have to find an explanation for why the state State yes. Would, would, would win with so many different Yes. 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 We haven't we haven't nut it's an excellent question, thank yeah. you. We haven't nutted this out entirely, but I think it's fair to say that this follows the, the pattern in Asia Minor. Um, and if we were going to be looking for a participative connection, if we were going to be looking for a reason why our historical uh, sources point to that part of the world as being uh, where Pisistus went. That's probably where we got the idea from, because this is exactly what you what you find over there. It's different from, for instance, uh, the, the turtles of Egana or the, the Pegasi of, um, of Corinth, etc. So it's a it's a different way of looking at it. But it's not unusual in it's the, in the mm. Yeah. And in fact many of these are quite similar. Yeah. Extremely similar. Sure. Yeah. I knew about the electric point, which was also the silver point. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I'm not correct if, uh, I'm, not, if I'm, not, I'm trying to think back to, I don't know, second year undergraduate. But uh, Kizikis, if I remember correctly, continued various types for much, uh, for a long time yes. thereafter. Yes. They just had the tiny, I think, maybe underneath some of them. Uh, well, they, they do, but they have many different yeah, types. Yeah. Many, many yeah. types. Yeah. 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 And then that can be useful. Example. Absolutely. For a long, long time. Uh, well, well down for centuries, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then sure. it remains for us to thank our speaker once again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.